Hi, this is Kimberly, the wife of Frankie Cannoli, and this is our Dope History. Author Robert Brault once wrote, Charisma is not just saying hello. It's dropping what you're doing to say hello. Frenchy Cannoli was a man with natural charisma. He is also widely celebrated as one of the exceptional hashish makers of our time. Beyond that, Frenchy was a highly passionate person that had a long and intimate relationship with what he would refer to as the sacred plant. Larger than all of this, Frenchy Cannoli was a husband and a father. Today, Dope History is grateful to be speaking with Madame Cannoli, who is here to reflect on the life and teachings of her beloved husband. She shares her plans for the future and stories from the past, including this next one about how those two came to be a couple. Frenchie was born in southern France, in Nice, but the very early years of his life were in Africa, in Gabon, where his father was working. He did something in forestry, and then later they lived on the uh, Atlantic coast when he was 7 to 12 years old, and then finally his teenage years were spent in Nice. When he was young, he was so smitten by stories of adventurers and there was one French adventurer called um, Henri de Montfred and this person had done um, adventures in North Africa between North Africa and Greece I think it was he had built himself a a little uh, um, boat kind of in the local North African style and I guess he used to go diving for pearls and he was a hash smuggler so like he was one of Frenchies kind of original role models, if you will. But Frenchie ended up traveling all over the world. Initially, he spent a lot of time in Mexico, in the desert, looking for um, peyote and being very successful at that. Loved Mexico, um, went back to France, intending to go back to Mexico, but he had a friend who was wanting to go to India. And so they decided to throw an I Ching to determine should they go to Mexico together or should they go to India together. And um, the I Ching guided them to go to India. And um, initially, I don't think Frenchie was, you know, quite as enamored of India as he later came to be. I think because he had so recently been in the desert in uh, Mexico and really enjoyed that kind of solitary natural space. And when you first come to India, the kind of crowds, the amount of humanity can be a little overwhelming if you live in a place that, you know, maybe is lessly populated. And somehow they were three friends traveling together. They ended up in Nepal. And I was in Nepal. I had um, flown to Bangladesh and then traveled overland to India and then up to Nepal. And um, I met them one evening. I was sitting at a table having dinner with a couple other women travelers, you know, kind of as you did back in the day, meeting people uh, on the road. And Frenchie's friend came up to the table and we were three women at the table and they were three men. And he made the kind of association like we should all sit together. And so... The two other women, you know, quickly left. They were, um, I think, Scandinavian, and they were, like, probably more savvy about the whole situation than I was. But um, the next day was that friend's birthday, and they were going to have a full moon party on the edge of the lake because we were um, at Lake Pokhara, and they invited me to the full moon party. And they had made what they called a majun, you know, kind of using the Moroccan term for a sweet mix that also has a lot of hashish in it. And they had done something where they took a lot of dried fruit and macerated it in some kind of alcohol with a bunch of hashish. And at the time in Nepal, the kind of choice, I just remember everybody who went to Nepal and stayed for a while, you tended to lose a bit of weight because the food choices were pretty limited and there wasn't a lot of sugar in what we ate. 
And so they made this dessert for this full moon party. And I think all of us, everybody got really, really high because we ate too much because we were all craving the sugar. <laughs> um, and Frenchie later avowed that there was a tremendous amount. He said something that sounded just like ridiculous to me, like there was 100 grams in it. I think it's an exaggeration, but maybe not far. Um, so we all ended up consuming large quantities of that and walking in the rice fields looking for mushrooms on the full moon night. So it was quite an epic beginning to uh, just the magical times with all of those French people. So we did that. Then I needed to have my visa renewed and the friend needed to have his visa renewed. So all of us took a bus trip to Kathmandu together, spent some time together. Then they were on their way somewhere and I was on my way somewhere else. And so we split up, and I ran into them randomly traveling around India, which is a huge country, in very, very different places, very far from each other, four times. Yeah, it was like fate was like, come on, you guys need to get together. <laughs> we need, I have plans for you. And Frenchie and I always joke, they, you know, the universe wanted us to have our daughter because she's an amazing human being. And so that's kind of why. We needed this nudging to uh, make that happen. But the last time I was walking through, I was in Varanasi, and there's kind of an area where there's lots of small shops with really, really small, small streets. And so I was walking by the shops, and a hand reached out from one of the shops and grabbed me, and it was Frenchie's friend. And he was like, the two of you need to stop meeting like this. Frenchie's birthday is going to be in Ampi on such and such a date come to the birthday party. And um, I was very blasé. And I was like, yeah, maybe if I have time. <laughs> um, but of course, I went. And, it, um, to, you know, back in the day, we didn't have cell phones or any means of communication in India that was in any way reliable or fast. But um, I took a train to Ampi. At, you know, and it wasn't like he had laid out a map saying, okay, this is where we're going to meet in Ampi. It was there's ruins of temples in Ampi along some river. We're going to meet there. So I took a train to Ampi, and I remember arriving by myself at sunset, having no idea, even from the train station, which way to go. And there was kind of a orchard of banana trees, I remember. And so I started walking on a path through the banana trees. And I don't know, I must have been like three minutes down the path, and I ran smack into Frenchie. It was just amazing and so we had an amazing birthday and by that time they were I think 11 Frenchmen and me and so we just started traveling around India together and I traveled like that with them for nine months and then uh, they went and did their stuff and I went back to Japan where I had been a student before to teach some English to make some more money and got involved in a program where I ended up in the university in in Japan, studying Japanese, doing a full degree, and Frenchie and I would travel back and forth. He would come and visit me. I would go and visit him in Goa when he was there in the winter, and we did that for like nine years, and then um, our daughter was born, and then he started, you know, coming to where I was more extended, and... um, After a while, you know, she needed to have an education. Initially, we went back to France. We didn't like it at all. And so we ended up in California um, in the time when cannabis was legal if you were a medical patient. So, you know, after my daughter had left the house and gone away to school, Frenchie got um, really involved in that aspect of legalization here in California and started getting requests from people to to teach them how to to make hashish. In the underground world of cannabis growing and hashish production, people didn't have instruction manuals available to purchase or websites to visit for seeking out knowledge on the subject. Speaking freely about the practices and activities could, in many parts of the world, come with extreme consequences. Teachings were often passed on farmer to farmer and generation to generation. High in the hills of Afghanistan or in the fields of India, generations of hashish producers have mastered their techniques and craft. 
Knowing that the best way to learn was through experience, Frenchy set out at a young age to travel the world in order to gain unique insights about cannabis and hashish production. While on his journey, he developed a deeper connection and relationship with the plant. Instead of hoarding his wealth of accumulated knowledge, Frenchy was adamant about sharing these teachings with anyone that would listen. He ended up working for a friend's brother, and they were Lebanese immigrants. And I guess this person had something to do with the manufacturing of hashish and distribution in uh, southern France. So Frenchy learned, you know, uh, initially some of the, the basics from this Lebanese friend. And then later in his early 20s, maybe like 1920, he went to Morocco and did some work there. He was taught by people in Morocco, Lebanese person in France. Um, he spent time in Pakistan. He spent time with uh, the refugees from Afghanistan and New Delhi. He spent years up in the mountains in India, uh, working side by side along people that he had rented you know, fields from them year after year for a number of years. So he was exposed to two main methodologies, the charas, which is you know, rubbing the resin from the live plant in the field on the palm of your hand, and then the sieving methodology that's used traditionally in places where the material is drier, so places like Afghanistan, Lebanon, Morocco. Yeah, so he learned, but it was a more traditional learning, a learning by observation and replication. So I think when Frenchie says he didn't have formal training, in his mind, formal training would have been Look at this plant material. Do you see on the surface there's trichomes? And within that trichomes, there's resin. And it's this resin that contains the terpenes and the cannabinoids that we're after to create this amazing hashish. So he didn't have that kind of training that explained to him what was going on, you know, kind of scientifically with the plant, or also that explained why we're using these tools to do what we're doing. Because when he started to really look at how am I going to teach people? That's the first thing he did. He talks about it, you know, like in his workshop, he always starts with a lecture that he calls the science behind. Because for him, it was the plant that informed logically what tools you were going to use. And when you understood the tools, when you understood that you were sieving, that you were not extracting something from the plant, that should really have a huge impact on your brain to think really clearly about how those tools need to be. So, for example, when he first started out, all the sieving bags were like plastic tubes with the sieving material on the bottom. And he went to a manufacturer who was making the bags and said, I want you to make a full mesh bag for me. Because Frenchie really understood he was sieving, he was not extracting, and he wanted to sieve really efficiently You want as wide of work surface as possible with pristine, clean meshes because you want to be able to move that material over the work surface quite far and spread out to facilitate those little tiny trichome heads falling cleanly through those perforations in the mesh, you know, that are varying sizes that we use when making the hashish. The culture around hashish, traditional hashish, you know, this sieved resin pressed with a sort of source of heat into a mass had largely been eradicated by the feds, you know, because they had put all of the Brotherhood of Eternal Love and the other major smugglers of hashish from producing countries into jail. They had been, you know, very successful in breaking up the pipeline of you know, traditional hashish to the U.S. So you had a couple generations that didn't even know what it was. When Frenchie was first, you know, trying to uh, share this with the various medical groups and whatnot, you know, he would go to conferences and they, you know, like people under 40 would <laughs> would be like, don't know, but willing to try. So he, Frenchie would share his hash at these these conferences and little by little, you know, kind of creative converts, if you will, in the cannabis community in California. And we saw, you know, kind of that acceleration of people realizing that the magic is in the trichomes. And that was the other thing, you know, 
I think sometimes North America is almost like a, a big island in that some things don't come to us that the rest of the world is already aware of or looking at in a sense. In Europe, when you look at the cannabis plant, you're looking at the resin. And I think you're doing that because, you know, there's like that pathway from Europe literally to producing countries. If you wanted to, you could walk there. So those traditions have been brought to Europe. You know, when Napoleon went to Egypt and his troops started consuming hashish, they brought those traditions back to France with them. We didn't have that in the U.S. For whatever reason, when we looked at the plant, we looked at the flower and we, you know, so we consumed the flower. And I remember, you know, when Frenchie was, you know, linking up with farmers and whatnot way back People used to throw their trim away or feed it to, to animals or use it in the compost without having removed the trichomes first. You know, in terms of Frenchie's education, to be able to share those best practices, to help people understand how to really cleanly sieve that resin to get this essence of hashish in the perfect form that they have that to consume It's just this kind of perfect virtuous circle of what he was given as a young person and then his connection with these amazing farmers in Northern California and, you know, other areas. It's just such an honor. And uh, he really felt it as such and felt the the responsibility of trying to do this in, um, in the right way. I think for anybody who's lived in India for a long period of time, and who has smoked a shilam and smoked with the sadhus or attended some of the um, traditional celebrations associated with the charas in India around the, the Hindu god Shiva, you develop a, a reverence for the plant. Frenchie used to say his connection with cannabis, with hashish, was initially a useful love story, and then he traveled to India and it became a spiritual practice. Because the lovely thing there is when you smoke the shilam, before you smoke it, you say a small prayer. You say a small dedication to the gods and in that sense, an extension to the plant. So yeah, there is this tremendous amount of reverence around what a blessing it is to be able to consume this plant that makes you feel so comfortable, so good in your skin. Um, And then Frenchie had the kind of added... Um, what can I say? He he spent a lot of time in India, in northern India, in the mountains, very, very high up in the mountains, in a very isolated place where they had these wild cannabis fields that he was working. And a lot of times, just days on end by himself, just him and the cannabis and these fields and working hand after hand in, um, you know, different sections and kind of noticing how the terpene profile slightly modified as you went from being near oak trees to being near strawberry patches or so just this really magical, magical time in communion with the plant. And so I think it, you know, anybody who had that experience would be hard pressed not to have an almost spiritual connection to the plant, um, feeling like you're being guided or, or that you have a, a role to carry out in what the plant has shared with you. Um, so, yeah, I think Frenchie felt very much that connection and that responsibility to try and continue the evolution of cannabis knowledge, you know, best practices around hash making for people in the West. And he thought about it for a while and really reflected on how generous people had been to him all over the world in terms of his learning. He always said that he didn't go to these places specifically with the intention to learn the process. He went with the desire to make what he was going to smoke for the year, the highest quality that he could. And it was almost like an act of, you know, osmosis that by working with these people, and having them guide him in what the best processes were, because sometimes he would ask them like, so why do you do this? Or why do you do that? And they would say, because it makes good hashish. Um, And like all of us at the time, we didn't have access to good information. There weren't as much scientific studies that were accessible to 
you know, non-students or professors in the university. Or without the internet, you would have had to belong to a university to access those studies or to at least have the understanding of how that was done. And in many cases, probably if you were trying to access those studies, maybe the government would want to know why. So back in the day, we didn't even have the correct terminology. But Frenchy was lucky because he did work, you know, in different places with different people and helped them make their hash and was exposed to a variety of different techniques. So when that came time to have the opportunity to work with these amazing farmers in the Emerald Triangle who had been, you know, kind of nurturing their craft and their genetics and doing it in a place that had a terroir so well suited for producing, you know, high quality plant material that could make, you know, amazing hashish. It was just a kind of perfect synergy. When he first was asked to do the work, I asked him, I said, so are you going to, I don't know, in some way ask people to keep private what you're you're showing them? Because other people were doing that. You know, people were having people sign things to say that he wouldn't share their tech. And Frenchy was, no. Um, he said, you know, everything was given to me as the clueless, he used to say, as the clueless youth I was um, back in the way in the most generous manner. You know, people invited me into their homes to share their food and to share their space and to uh, and to experience this tradition that had been passed down to them literally for generations in many of these parts of the world. And so it was almost like, um, I don't know, he used to say too, you know, that he felt that the cannabis plant had more influence and control over how she was moved around the world than we gave her credit. And I think he liked to think that like maybe, you know, he was one of those people that she chose to, to do her bidding and to share this information. Frenchy Cannoli was called toward a life of service to the cannabis plant. At an early age, like most people, he felt a pressure upon graduating high school to fit into a mold and live a life which he considered boring and uninspiring. Unlike the majority of people, he took a leap of faith into a world of his own making. Along the journey, he crossed paths with many like-minded individuals and lasting relationships were formed. Frenchie was more than a hash maker. He was a writer, a podcaster, an instructor, and creator of a four-part video series teaching people about hashish production. The gift of his acquired knowledge was not lost on him, and he set out to perpetuate the teachings to those willing to listen. It is important to Frenchie that people live their passion, and if making hash was yours, you quickly became friends. He had a dear friend when he was 17 years old that I guess um, with some trepidation approached him about smoking hashish because back in the day, there was so much misinformation, kind of that viral expansion of the misguided American war on drugs when it comes to children, it just, you know, it seeped in everywhere because they made it such a part of all the policies that they had with, you know, so many other countries. And so in France, there was really this sense among a lot of people, among a lot of straight people all over the world, I guess, that you were somehow like the dregs of society if you consumed cannabis. But Frenchy smoked it, and he used to say that, you know, it was such a revelation. It brought back kind of that pure happiness of childhood. Hashish just gave him a profound feeling of, he used to call it, well-beingness. When he got out of high school, there was this pressure of, okay, now you have to commit to some kind of job, and you're going to do this job for 40 years and kind of be in misery, but you're going to do it to make money so that you can retire at 55 and then you know like like he had this anxiety around having to commit to a life that he didn't really want to do at such a young age and so being able to leave and to start traveling and to connect with this plant that brought him back into a kind of natural well-being that he only remembered from really really early childhood that was such a revelation and such a guidance to his life. So I think there was that element also of sharing that with young people that 
you have choices and it's up to you to make the life that you feel called to live. And it may not look like what your parents want, but you know, you should do that. You should follow that. And I think that's another reason why a lot of people, a lot of people have expressed to me that, you know, Frenchie was kind of an inspiration at that level, a role model, because he profoundly lived, you know, his calling and was able to, you know, really dive deep into this passion that he had for the plant, but also for the creativity that that, that gave him because, you know, he didn't only do cannabis things. He was very artistic and cannabis fueled this joy in his life that allowed him to express, you know, these other attributes that most people can express when they're in a good place with themselves. I think Frenchie was very charismatic. Also, Frenchie was sincerely interested and loved connecting with other people. He's just one of those people that, you know, like you'd be at a bus stop and somehow, you know, somebody would say something and, you know, you'd just end up talking with him and having a great conversation and miss your bus kind of thing. And then I think there was the added charm that, like I said, you know, so he was attending these cannabis events and he was sharing what he was making. And for a lot of people, they hadn't seen that kind of quality ever before. Um, And so to have this, you know, kind of charming French person talking about his love for the product, which was really, you know, infectious and then sharing it with you. And then maybe, you know, later you learn to make it with him and then you take that information and share it elsewhere because the cannabis community is, is relatively small. You end up meeting each other again and again at these various events. I mean, especially during the therapeutic use laws here in California, there used to be events, conferences, and, you know, the various cups and competitions practically every weekend. And so there were a lot of times to just meet up with old friends in in very, you know, kind of... um, now that I think of it, such comfortable and easy settings where it was legal for you to, you know, to smoke together, you didn't have to have an event license and there didn't have to be all this rigmarole around, you know, only being allowed to carry so much with you or having people there that might be checking your bags or whatnot. It was a really nice period of time for the community to be in a safe space together. And Frenchie made a lot of friends during those events. And uh, it's just such an honor. And uh, he really felt it as such. He put a lot of effort into writing extensively about hashish and kind of the science behind it. He had professional videos made to show people how to do it. He did a lot of lectures and podcasts and just trying to make people aware that this was a plant therapy that's really accessible to them and felt the, the responsibility of trying to do this in um, in the right way. Um, so, you know, he paid to have his workshop professionally uh, filmed. And so it, we made a four-part series. And after Frenchie's passing, a gentleman in Brazil contacted me who's in the film industry who said, hey, I'd like to create subtitles in Portuguese for your films so that more people can be aware of Frenchie's teachings in Brazil. So he did that. And then he came to me and he said, why don't you ask other people with other languages if they would also create the subtitles? If they do, I have the software, you know, to put them um, against the film correctly. And we can make this available to more and more people. And now we just finished our sixth language. We have English subtitles because Frenchie's accent was so heavy. We have the Portuguese, then we have Spanish, we have French, we have Italian, and we just finished German. And I'm going to get emotional, but we're also working on doing Arabic and Hebrew, which I plan to release together. So yeah, it's been, sorry, so cool to see how this vision is not just Frenchies anymore. As, you know, life almost like as life intends these things, sometimes good things that help humanity like refine the path of light, you know, a few good people 
like carry it forward. And I just feel so honored that I've had, you know, this small group of people translating for for no, they're not making money off of it. You know, they're not getting like huge fame from it just because they also feel that this information deserves to be shared. His website has all of our content, you know, and so there's a page there that has all of the writings for people who are text-based learners. Frenchie wrote for five years for Weed World magazine in the UK, and they've generously allowed me to repost all the PDFs there. The last six um, articles that he did are actually a recap of his workshop, The Lost Art of the Hashishin Workshop. And then equally on that page is one for the do-it-yourself videos in the six languages that we have thus far. So um, you can find the links there all in one place super easily. And then another thing that we've been doing, another aspect of um, hashish that Frenchie was very interested in, was this process of aging hash and the transformation that that has on hashish. So we've been working with a lab in Canada called High North and um, we're studying the aging process. They've been doing lab tests for us. So we just um, last year finished a six-month study, and then in the near future, we're going to be launching another year-long study on aging hashish, and so the lab results can be found there. Another fun thing that's on the website is what we call the results of our hash porn contests. So during the pandemic, you know, when we couldn't go to any of the conferences anymore, at the beginning of 2020, we had amazing conferences scheduled where we were going to go to Canada for the one conference, do a couple of workshops on the East Coast, and then we were going to go to Barcelona. Frenchie had been invited to the big cannabis conference in Israel to speak, and then everything got shut down in March. And so, you know, we were pretty, you know, despondent over that. So Frenchie decided to put together this contest that he called his hash beauty contest because it was only photographs. We couldn't smoke it. We couldn't smell. But basically to invite people from all over the world to share what they were making and that Frenchie would repost his favorite photos. And then we would have a little totally subjective, you know, kind of group, how many like, you know, which one got the most likes and give out some small gifts or, or declare some people winners. Although from our perspective, Everybody that we reposted to a degree as a winner because it was all beautiful, amazing hash being produced all over the world. So we just finished the fifth um, iteration of that for Frenchie's birthday this last year, which would have been December 13th. He would have been 65. And um, I collect all those photos and I repost them um, on the website as well. Um, and it's pretty cool to look at. The passing of Frenchie Cannoli on July 18, 2021 came unexpectedly. Like a steady rain that forms into a river, the outpouring of memories and appreciation from the cannabis world began to stream into his social media channels. Amidst this somber time, unlikely sources from mainstream media reached out to Madame Cannoli for information regarding Frenchie's life. His natural enthusiasm for the craft of hashish production transcended the boundaries of legality and this was recognized by media outlets that wouldn't traditionally cover such taboo topics. Those actions speak to the legacy that Frenchie created for himself, aided by the loving support and guidance from his wife, family, and friends. There were, last time I looked, 330,000 people who saw the death announcement, which just floored me. And then, you know, I believe there were over 9,000 comments and unfortunately, after a minute, when you're scrolling, it doesn't allow you to scroll efficiently. You know, so even I couldn't see all the comments. I had the New York Times reach out to me to do an obituary, and I had The Economist in England. And initially, when the New York Times called, I was like, what? You know, I, <laughs> my normal PTSD <laughs> kicked in, you know, from hiding for so many years. I was kind of like, are they going to do something nice or are they going to not do something nice? But the guy could not have been more kind. And I asked him, I was like, so why are you writing about a hash maker? And he said, they give him the choice. Like every week they send him, you know, like 20 
people to choose from that I guess have recently, you know, passed. And he said he'd like to work and learn more about people who were passionate about what they did. And that the little that he saw, you know, in the beginning of, you know, looking into Frenchie, that he had a lot of passion for what he was doing. So I felt that that was lovely. I think he did a pretty good job, although he did refer to cannabis as a drug, um, which, you know, it's just like, okay, you're showing your age a little bit. But then the one also that was done by The Economist in England, that one really surprised me because basically cannabis is still illegal in England. So part of me was like, wow, if the journalists are starting to write about it in this, you know, to basically celebrate this hash maker, maybe there's hope. Um, Because it just feels like if England could go in a positive direction, if they could really lighten up on their regulations and make it accessible to their population, that the rest of Europe would kind of fall in line a little bit more easily. Although, I mean, I know it's been so weird recently because it feels like Holland has gone a little bit backwards in terms of their legalization and Spain is, well, Barcelona anyway, where, you know, normally we could go to the social clubs and it was so lovely to have these these spaces that were not accessible to, you know, the general public, you couldn't see it because they were always in buildings where there weren't like windows or whatnot, where the people passing by could know what was going on inside. I always thought that was such a perfect balance to society, that there was a place for kind of like bars, I guess, where adults do adult things that children don't need to have exposure to at a young age. And I really felt like somehow they had understood something and that there was a harmony there. But recently there's been, you know, crackdowns and they've been stepping a little backwards. So I'm not sure what all of that's about because I really thought that things were going pretty well there. I think for a lot of people, it would be really manageable. Um, And I just can't help but think in an aging population, this is something that more people should have access to. And That's why a lot of our work, you know, these last few years, he's really switched from thinking about marketing a product to promoting and sharing more extensively the education, that it's not that hard for somebody to have a mini washer or another tool in their kitchen and some sieving bags to make their own really high quality product for themselves and their family. Because if you do it right, it's very shelf stable on top of it. Frenchie used to take very, very small hash balls and eat it with um, his coffee in the morning because he had some arthritis. And at that level, you know, consumed as an edible, it's great for overall body pain management and non-toxic. And, you know, you don't have, it doesn't have the side effects issues that aspirin has. And it doesn't get you very high when you consume such, you know, really small quantities like that. So I told you, French, he's very multifaceted. He was also a graphic designer. At one point, he used to design websites back in the day when my daughter was very um, small. And when we first started putting the brand together, he and Leo Stone from Aficionado, Leo ama- has just such an amazing talent for packaging. They sat down and talked about, you know, how Frenchie's boxes could look. And so Frenchie designed this logo for himself, which is a stylized trichome head. A lot of people think that it's a skeleton. It's not a skeleton. That's a trichome head. Um, And then Frenchie did a whole series of these trichome heads that he put different hats on them. For example, for his apprentice, he made her a special trichome head that's just a unique design um, for her. There's one that's a, a girl with a bow. Yeah, so we've done some collector's pins and some T-shirts with these motifs on it. And then after Frenchie's passing, people started reaching out to me, sending me photos of their arms that they had had Frenchie's trichome head um, logo tattooed on their arm, um, larger than their arms. There's a couple legs, but most people on the arms. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool because it doesn't say Frenchie Cannoli. It's just the trichome head logo. But it hit me if you knew, you knew. So it was almost like it was like this secret handshake that, you know, like if we had this club, you know, that was like this 
smokers club just for high quality hash. You would come to the door and you would flash your tattoo and we'd be like, okay, you're in. <laughs> well, and that's why I posted a couple, like, if you know, you know, because if, you know, people who have been involved with friendship for a long time, they realize this is not a skeleton. Okay. He was a bit of a pirate, but yeah, no, that's a track of head. Um, Anybody who's seen a macro, if, yeah, if you've seen a macro of a trichome head, you're like, yes, of course. So that was kind of Frenchie's secret symbol, if you will, or secret handshake of, you know, are you hip to hash smoking or hash, you know, what what is what hash is made from, basically? Do you understand the science behind, you know, what you're working with? Frenchie used to say, the quality that he makes doesn't come from him. It comes from the farmer that have grown the plant. And then in turn, those farmers, the reason they're able to produce the quality, because he only worked with outdoor, organic, regenerative farmers, is that they're doing it in a place that has the terroir. And this terroir is a French concept around, there's something about the land, the, the atmosphere, you know, the weather that surrounds that land, and then also the soul of the farmer working the land, that that combination of things produces a plant that has a fruit or a, a product that has a very distinguishable taste, flavor, that's representative. We say it's the taste of the place of that area. So Frenchie was very blessed to, you know, work with those um, they weren't farmers because they were. He was working in wild fields, but to work those wild fields in northern India and to experience that sense of the taste of a place very profoundly, because on top of it, when you make charis, it's really intimate. You know, you're rubbing your hands very carefully over the plant to not break off green material to just try and get the trichomes. Um, you know, so you have this cannabis resin that's seeping into your body as you're doing the work. So it's very, very profound to make that beautiful product, to have that experience, and then to come to Northern California where you have these farmers, multi-generational often, you know, that have been honing this craft around not only breeding the cannabis, but growing it under, you know, very difficult conditions because you have the U.S. government that has actually, you know, gone to war against its own citizens over a plant for generation after generation, but you have these kind of kindred spirits who are also fighting this good fight to let humanity know that, no, this propaganda, this misinformation around this plant was generated by a limited group of people with an ideology and and intentions that are not aligned with the greater good. And so to be able to, you know, have this see the light of day again and have more people realize that this is beneficial, this is, you know, to be happy. The life and teachings of Frenchie Cannoli are not gone with his passing. At the request of those close to the Cannolis, Kim has maintained her personal Instagram account as well as Frenchie's. Before his passing, Frenchie had requested that she continue his work. This includes documentaries, websites, studies about hashish, as well as conducting workshops with his longtime apprentice. The legacy isn't going away anytime soon. There are now hundreds of upper level hash makers in the US and throughout the world who have learned from his courses and have been counseled by his experience. Dope History would like to thank Madame Cannoli for being here to share her positive message and for the remembrance of her loving husband, a man who has paved his own way into dope history. So it's madame in the sense that madame means missus. So, you know, initially they were, they were like, you should be on Instagram. And I told them I'll only be on Instagram to help, you know, manage Frenchie's account and to be able to write comments in my own name. And they were talking about, so should you be queen cannoli or this, that, and the other. And I was like, no, 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 guys, if I'm going to be anything, I'm just Mrs. Cannoli. You know, I'm just like the wife behind the scenes, you know, keeping all the infrastructure together. And yeah, so it's Madame Cannoli, which is basically Mrs. Cannoli in English. So before his passing, Frenchie asked me to continue to support his legacy of education. 
um, we had been with the same filmmaker who made our do-it-yourself videos. Frenchie filmed over the course of three years the transition from medical use in California to adult use and the impact that had on the small farmers. We're just wrapping up literally the final edits this week and um, hope to have the film available for people to see in the very near future that kind of shows the work of the small farmers and, you know, the impact of legalization there, although it's gotten much dire since we finished the film, as everybody knows. And then I'm going to continue the hash porn because it really allows us to shine a light on new young people or people new to the industry and the beautiful work that's being done all over. It's a little frustrating because social media has gotten weird. And in Europe, sometimes when I post the offerings from people in Europe, Instagram takes them down. So that's you know, really disheartening and feels like a step backwards, this kind of repression from some of these European governments. Um, but we'll carry on as best we can. And then Frenchie also had an apprentice who worked with him for over seven years. Her name is Laura Bell, and now she runs a facility in Ukiah. And she and I are going to uh, continue to do Frenchie's hands-on in-person workshops in the near future. We'll have some, you know, announcements about that. But uh, yeah, because she, she lived with us and worked with him so long and is such a great representative of, again, carrying on the legacy. Um, Frenchie did a lot of workshops over the last five years. Over a thousand people attended his workshop. And a lot of the people who are pretty successful in the industry, you know, either went to Frenchie's workshop or called him up on a regular basis to kind of talk shop about making hashish. So I think the seeds he planted are varied and far and wide to help really, really help cannabis, you know, kind of carry forward and uh, support humanity in just helping everybody find well-beingness. Thank you for, for having me and allowing me to do that. And I think if, you know, if it kind of, touches a few more people or, you know, creates a a link that expands people's understanding uh, about what they can can do themselves with the plant, especially in this day and age when things have gotten crazy expensive or in many cases it's both expensive and the quality is inferior. Um, You know, that was Frenchie's wish. I mean, that's always what he was after was, you know, that was his motivation behind going to these producing countries and working alongside people was to just make the best quality product he could for his own consumption. And that's what he would wish for everybody who is studying, you know, um, the methodology that he's sharing. To be able to kind of celebrate him and share these memories of this well-lived life, I really think, I mean, for me, doing it is part, you know, really to be able to say to young people, follow that life's longing that is being drawn through you in a very specific, very individual way. I always think of this Cahill Gabon poem. He did one called On Children, and it's two new parents. And it says, your children are not your children. They are life longing for itself. And then something along the lines that you're just the bow that's going to shoot this arrow that is the child as straight as you possibly can. So really, you know, allowing children and people to follow their own destiny, if you will. And I think human society, you know, has become so structured that many people, for whatever reason, get caught up in that structure and are not able to fully live what what their destiny is supposed to be. Um, So if Frenchie, I think that's the beauty too of the energetic field that surrounds us is that Frenchie dumped a lot of really, really positive you know, energy into the epigenetic field for young people to more self-actualize into that potential of what they're supposed to do. So whether it be hash making or, you know, farming or what, whatever, woodworking, you know, whatever amazing thing you're called to do, if you do that with passion and with joy, that's a good thing. Because if we had a lot more happy people all around us, the world would be a radically different place. So if if I've helped in the smallest little way to uh, support people in, in doing that, then 
Frenchie's legacy is moving in the right direction. Two, one, four.